So good evening again, welcome along to In Conservation With. My name is David Lindo, I'm also known as the Urban Birder, believe it or not. And with me tonight um, is a guy I've known apparently for 12 years. I, I, I think it's longer actually, was it at London Zoo we met on the London Zoo project? Was it there? You know, London Zoo, the times I've been to London Zoo, I think the first half of the times I've been there, I used to bunk in, like climbing over the fence or not paying generally. And then the second half of my sort of London Zoo going, I've paid. So maybe it's during the paid time. Maybe, maybe. Ah, well, oh well. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so Edward Mayer, very pleased to meet, to see you here and to meet you online. Um, you're not a, a Zoom aficionado, but um, you will be soon. I've done one show so far on Zoom. Yeah. Okay. This um, is the second. Well, I, I couldn't do a series of In Conservation with without Edwards because, you know, swifts are a very special family of birds, much loved by a lot of people, um, including myself. I think I put them in there as um, one of my top 10 favourite birds. I actually say they're probably in the top five. Love them to death. But they've been going through a bit of problems um, over the last few decades. But anyway, let me just quickly give you a rundown as to who um, Edward is. Um, and then Edward could possibly tell me if I'm uh, going wrong and actually embellish anything as well. But basically you first became fascinated, fascinated by Swifts at the age of six. Um, can you tell us about that initial oh, yeah, nature? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, we, we lived in Southampton then, and uh, I think Swifts were the first bird I noticed. We, we lived in a little street near the common, and there were Swifts screaming overhead. They nested in the street, and I checked recently, they still do nest in the street, which is lovely. And um, I used to lie on my back and just watch the Swifts screaming overhead um, in the summer. And... Um, they were just wonderful. They were so exciting. I mean, they're so, they've got such a, they're so unearthly. They're not hampered by having to walk or stick to the ground like us. They're, they just sort of bounce and bound through the air. And that was what excited me so much. Because as a small child, so much is a big effort. I mean, going up the stairs is a big effort. And, and, and the world is very... Um, sort of designed against you. Getting on the bus, big effort, often had to be picked up and put on the bus and that sort of thing. But Swifts just shot around everywhere and they were so intangible and so dramatic, I just fell in love with them. And that was it really, that was the start of bird watching for me. I moved on to quite quickly to things like Great Crested Greeds and, and, and jays and glossy, flashy birds that there were around Southampton, but the swifts were the start. It's interesting because um, one of my, I mean, I started birding when I was five or six and I, I knew about swifts, I saw them flying around, but when I was about 11 or 12, I decided alongside a friend of mine to do some scientific research instead of playing football in the prefabs. And we tried to catch swifts flying low overhead by throwing our trainers up at them, hoping that they'd fly inside the train and come down safely. Oh, yeah. We were totally yeah. unsuccessful. Yeah. Um, and we did it in the name of science, but obviously we weren't that um, sort of clued up. Mm. So, uh, but, were, you know, we were fascinated by them. So you kind of grew up, um, your spark bird, as our American colleagues would say, was the common swift. And did you grow up... Um, to kind of go to university and study zoology, biology or something? Um, and were you also sort of watching nature uh, a lot then as well? Yeah, I went to university, went to Nottingham University actually, which is um, right next, well, very close to a, a, a rather nice, a very nice Tudor, I guess, Deer Park with a ancient house in it called Wollaton Hall. Um, which actually holds the city of Nottingham's Natural History Museum. And Wollaton Hall is very interesting because it belonged to a man called Willoughby, who, as you know, is one of the first great amateur ornithologists in Britain. And he, his, he had a book printed of pictures of 
birds and one of the best illustrations in it is the swift and last time I was at Wollaton Hall a few years ago they had the book on display open at the picture of the swift so it's a good place for uh, swift study in a way um, I didn't study zoology I, I studied um, English literature and history of art um, but I kept up my bird watching all the time at university I used to nip out to Attenborough uh, gravel pits which were being just outside Nottingham. I had a bicycle, used to cycle out to Attenborough, and they were being converted into a nature reserve. The, 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 the gravel was being uh, run out, you know, they were running out of the gravel. So as each pit was abandoned, it, they let it flood. And uh, a lot of birds, a lot of birds were moving in. So it was a very good place for things like little skylarks nesting all over the place and little grebes everywhere. It was a really nice place, Attenborough. It's been turned into a sort of proper nature reserve now with a reserve centre and, um, you know, cafe, bookshop, all the rest of it. But it was just wild in those days and you wandered around while gravel extraction was going on. So it was fun. It was fun and I, I, it was a nice place to go um, to, as a relaxation from studying, and reading every single Shakespeare play and... Um, in the first year, they gave us a book list to read of over 700 books. <laughs> some, some people like me initially took it seriously. Yeah, that was a mistake. Yes. Mm. <laughs> so, Edward, can you explain to us what exactly is a Swift? I mean, we see Swifts are taken for granted, but what exactly is it? What's oh, well, it to, how do you describe a Swift? A Swift is... It's something that moves continuously. It's like a shark in the sea. If you look at, if you look at, see, look at a shark, a shark, sharks have to keep swimming all the time because um, they don't have swim bladders. They have to maintain buoyancy and they have to get water past their gills in order to oxygenate themselves. So most sharks are constant swimmers. Um, this idea of constant motion is very troubling to humans. They can't imagine a life without sitting still or lying down. Swifts fly continuously. Nearly all their lives are spent flying. The first three years are spent flying. If you think of the air as a liquid, which in fact it probably is, then think of the swift as a shark that just swims in air continuously. That's what a swift does. It is the most aerial of birds. It's adapted for constant flight and in fact it is safest in the air. It's got such short feet set so far back, it can't really walk. It can shuffle on the ground. But generally speaking, a swift on the ground is a swift in bad trouble. There's something wrong for it to have been on the ground in the first place. Um, but swifts are just built to fly. They are aerodynamically so superb. They can just fly continuously and they have you see how swifts fly, I mean, they're, they're all over the place, sudden turns, sudden climbing, sudden diving, twisting, turning on, 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 on not just on a sixpence, on, on a pin's head in the air. Um, well, when I started studying swifts, I mean, like 20 years ago, I got really interested in swifts again, and I, I, I determined to do something. I, I'd taken early retirement, and I determined to do something to help the swifts where I lived in London, because they were numbers were going down. Uh, sharpish and I thought well you know maybe I can maybe I can do something locally to help the Swifts and in the end with the encouragement of Chris Mead at the BTO I, I set up this London Swifts website to help the Swifts in London but I, I quickly realized that I didn't know enough so I started casting around for, for, for zoologists ornithologists who could teach me about Swifts and unfortunately poor old Chris Mead just died just then, it was a terrible tragedy, he just died one night, and I, I, I found out that there was nobody really who knew that much about Swifts, but in the end, I got my education in Swifts in Germany. I went to Berlin and I went to Frankfurt, I met two incredible chaps there, Ulrich Tiggers and Erich Kaiser, and I stayed with Erich Kaiser. Erich Kaiser's got 90 Swifts living in the top of his house, and about a dozen of the nests you can actually just go into a gable, sit in a dark 
black painted cupboard and watch through a perspex screen a dozen swifts, dozen pairs of swifts on the nest. And you can sit there without troubling them. So you can see exactly what they do. You can see them close up. Nobody had done that until Erich set that up. Nobody had done that really. David Lack had in Oxford, but those, those were the first people to do it since this Victorian clergyman had done it in the 1840s, lying on his tummy in a loft. So nobody had really seen what they did in the nest. And then I wanted to find out even more about Swift, so I started scouring universities. I found two that were working on Swifts. One in Sweden, the University of Lund, and one in Netherlands, and it wasn't zoologists who were studying Swift. It was aerodynamic engineers. And the chap in Sweden, part of his time he designed military drones, and the other part of his time he put Swifts into wind tunnels. Dead Swifts, wooden Swifts, live Swifts into wind tunnels to see how they work. And what they found is that Swifts incorporate three amazing technologies, which we have found quite separately. Something called high aspect wing ratio, which means it, it means a very, very long, very thin wing, and it gives you incredible fuel economy. You stick that onto a Boeing jet, and we can fly from London to Thailand or right across the Atlantic without refueling. We can fly now more cheaply than ever before. I mean, all of us can afford worldwide flight now. Just 30 years ago, it was intolerably expensive for us to contemplate, you know, worldwide flight. But now, you know, I know people that go off to Australia every couple of months to see their children and grandchildren. It's, it's affordable. It's affordable because of the design of the aircraft and the economy of the engines. And it, it, a Swift can fly for three or four days, nonstop, with no water and no food. That's the same. That's incredible fuel economy. And then they found that Swifts have got short takeoff and landing characteristics, much the same as you have with things like the Tornado fighter bomber, swing wing capability. It means you can tuck your wings back in a V for very high speed flight and pull them out for a short landing and a short takeoff at low speed, which means that a Swift can go straight into its nest hole and straight out of its nest hole at amazing speed and break inside the nest, which means they're not so vulnerable to predation at the nest. I've seen birds like kestrels, hobbies, catch hirundines at the nest. You know, they come up to the nest to feed the chicks and before they can get into the nest, kestrel has got them. And, um, it doesn't happen nearly as much with Swifts because the Swifts are so fast. And that's, that's down to their wing and wing control mechanisms. And then they've got another aerodynamic feature, um, leading edge vortex technology. Now, what that is, is means that the edge of the wing is designed or constructed in such a way as to create a sort of Swiss roll of air that rolls over the top of the wing and gives the bird extra lift. That air rolls over the wing. You can see it in some fighter jets you can, as it come past the air displays. You can see this condensed air, looks like smoke, coming over the top of the wing. That is the leading edge vortex and it gives the aircraft extra lift. So when the swift or the aircraft is at a high angle, very fast, a normal bird going like that will stall and just drop out of the air and flutter out, like those Boeing jets, the latest Boeing 737 model does. The computer control goes wrong, the aircraft goes up like that, and stalls and it flutters down and crashes. Swift don't. They go up and the leading edge vortexes flow over the top of the wing and suck it up into the air. So fantastic technology in a swift, in one small bird, incredible technology. And I know this because I've been to the lectures of this chap from Lund University. He lectures in English and he's been at our international biennial swift conferences. And so a whole new world about the swift opens up. I mean, all birds have got some unique aerodynamic features. Those long fingered wingtips on vultures and on crows give them incredible low speed control so a vulture can come in to land and land bang on the dead meat um, same with a crow they can just flutter in 
fact, wave the wingtips to get really good control of their landing position, control the air, and then bang, they're on the prey or dead food carrion first. So all birds, are, in terms of as flying machines, and all too often we do not regard birds as flying machines. We think they're lovely, we think they're wonderful, we think they're interesting. Do we watch how they fly, how they maneuver in 3D? Do we think about all the processes going on in their brain, the automatic flight control systems, how every single feather is connected to a nervous system that tells them you know, move, how the feathers are moving, how we control our wings and everything else so they know how to fly and what to do. So a lot of it's automatic and a lot of it is learned. We know with swifts, for example, that young swifts have a terrible time getting into a new nest hole. They may make several approaches and fail each time, but in the end they get it right. So that's learning ability. The flight to Africa, the migration, is in the head already. And that, that is just simply stunning. But there we are. I think we ought to think a lot more about how birds actually do it, how they fly. That is just another sort of miraculous, wonderful area of exploration for us. Yeah, tell us about, could you tell me up before we started this recording about those white-throated swifts you saw in... Uh, oh, yeah, well, one of my, yeah, we were chatting about that earlier. Well, one of my great, great <clears throat> swift experiences is I was on a bird watching trip in Colorado and it was in April and we went up to the Black Canyon it's a very popular tourist spot it's 8,000 feet high it's covered in snow and we were looking for I think blue grouse one of the grouse species anyway um, we were driving up in our minivan and we, we found the grouse walking down the gutter in the road to see towards us. So we stopped the minivan and opened the door and the grouse looked at us from about two feet away and we looked at the grouse and photographed it. So we got the grouse and so we went up to see if the visitor centre was open and might actually do a cup of hot coffee and um, I thought this is too good an opportunity to miss. I'm going to go and look at this canyon. And there was a sort of viewpoint, one of those sort of terrifying viewpoints, uh, cantilevered over the edge of the canyon. And you sort of look down, <laughs> you're looking down 8,000 feet and God, you feel ill. And so I tried not to look down after the first glimpse and I looked straight ahead. And there was this blizzard blasting down the Black Canyon, level with me. It must have been about minus 12, I think. It's quite windy. And all the snow was blowing down from the left. And after a while, I saw these white dots going the other way. And I thought, what on earth is that? White dots going the other way? What, what, what's this going on? And um, so I got my binoculars on the white dots and they turned out to be white throated swifts, a pretty big swift. And it's, it's one that migrates from like central, central USA down to um, Mexico. Um, for the winter, not a very big migration run. But here were these birds, 8,000 feet up, not that much oxygen, I guess, for, you know, less oxygen, anyway, a good deal less oxygen, 8,000 feet, and uh, powering their way with no chance of any food at all. I mean, there's going to be no insects in this blizzard. And water is going to be pretty tough. I mean, they'd have to dive 8,000 feet and try and find some unfrozen water at the bottom of the Black Canyon. I think the river was actually running because it wasn't cold enough to freeze the, the, the rapid river over. But all the same, diving 8,000 feet and then climbing 8,000 feet again for a drink it might, might not be on in those conditions. I don't know. But there they were powering through at 8,000 feet. And poof, I was just stunned. Um, I heard of swifts flying very, very high, flying over the Himalayas, for example, uh, but I'd never seen anything like this. And it does give you an idea. Um, I've got a friend in Germany who tells me that one of the best ways of watching common swifts and migration is to lie on your back on the lawn, put your binoculars to your eyes, and you will see incredibly high these specks going south. You won't see an awful lot of swifts migrating. You will not see, they'll be too high. But it all depends on the weather conditions, um, but they are simply amazing creatures. Yes, absolutely, like. I was on Radio Kent last Friday um, because the presenter was having an argument with his assistant as to what was the fastest bird in the world. His assistant was saying peregrine and he was saying swift. 
and I was brought in to settle the argument. And I actually said, you know what? In reality, both of you were kind of right because the Peregrine does 200 miles an hour, but it's in a stoop, it's diving. Whereas the white-throated needle tail, powering itself in level flight can do, I think, 110 miles an hour or something. Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. Phenomenal. I know. I know. Yeah, you know, imagine the flight control, the vision needed, the abilities needed to control yourself. Um, um, you, 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 can, well, you can do it in a car, but um, your risk is, 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 is higher than for the wide-throated needle tail. I mean, partly it's that swift flying clear air, and until aircraft came along, there were no threats. Swifts turn up quite often inside aircraft and jet engines. Uh, I, had a, I had a long chat with the um, Civil Aviation Authority some years ago, and they objected to one of my proposals, which was to, uh, I was working with London Zoo then, and they were thinking of opening a new aquarium in Docklands, and, um, or else on the Greenwich Peninsula, one, either one side or the other. And um, I was asked to install, to design in some swift nest facilities there, and I proposed seven or eight swift nests, and it was vetoed by the Civil Aviation Authority as being too close to London City Airport. And I said, for God's sake, they're tiny little birds. You've got much more to worry about at London City Airport. You've got swans, you've got Canada geese, you've got gulls. And they said, no, 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 they often turn up in jet engines. Um, well, clearly they don't bring the aircraft down, thank God. But um, I, I often wonder at what height they end up in the aircraft engines. Quite interesting to know. They find the debris, the feathers, and they find rings sometimes in the engines, and that's, that's how they identify them. Well, as well, I mean, you may not know Zoomers, but Swifts are a worldwide, worldwide family of birds, and I believe their closest relatives are hummingbirds. Um, but tonight, you're going to tell us about the plight of the common Swift that's found yeah. in Europe yeah. and Europe. Yes, I've got a little presentation for you. To really, it's to encourage you to put up swift nest boxes. Yeah. Um, and um, I'll answer questions at the end about any, any aspects you, 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 care to, you care to think about. Now, technically, putting up swift nest boxes, I mean, the nest boxes are cheap. They range from very cheap, like sort of 16 pounds to very expensive, well over 100. And basically what you pay for, you get for. Um, you'll get a much better box or a longer lasting box or a bigger box for, your more, for more money. Um, the most difficult thing, nothing to do with the Swifts at all. The most difficult thing is putting them up on your building high enough. Um, and I'll, I, I, we've got suggestions about how you can do that without having to risk life and limb on your own ladder. Um, often TV aerial companies will put them up quite cheaply for you. So that's, that's, that's uh, an option. They're used to working at height and um, they've got the kit. So that's an answer. Um, otherwise there's like your grandchildren who may be capable of going up a ladder and you might, you know, sort of threaten them a bit and get them to go up a ladder. If they don't put it up, they're out of your will, for example, a very good, very good uh, ploy to take with grandchildren. Um, but um, it's not as difficult as it seems. There are ways, ways around it. It looks like, a, you know, it's so much more difficult than putting up that blue tip box. But in fact, you can do it. And many people do. I mean, I just checked today. There's 93 Swift groups running now in the UK. Um, I've been proselytizing, preaching on behalf of Swifts for getting on for 20 years now. And um, I've done something like 350 talks so far, training people. I talk to bird clubs and I talk also to local authority planners and I do a lot with architects as well. I do a lot of urban biodiversity talks for architects. I, I, I do a series of talks called Supporting and Enhancing Urban Biodiversity, which is everything plus Swifts, uh, trying to make urban places better at hosting wildlife, trying to make people more tolerant of attractive, beneficial wildlife and trying to make life just that much more pleasant, more green, wetter, more water around the place, more plants around the place, more wildlife around the place, and trying to make life just that much more pleasant for all of us and healthier too. I mean, during lockdown, so many people have said, oh, at last, I, I, you know, I really, I've been out in the garden every day. 
Yeah, isn't it wonderful? I've seen all these new things. I mean, we, my wife and I found leaf cutter bees in the garden and a friend helped us identify them and they've been busy cutting up the roses and we've made a huge insect hotel. My wife and I have been drilling away with electric drills and bits of old wood and uh, all sorts of wonderful insects we've been spotting because um, you know, it's not so easy seeing the birds, but uh, we've been doing it with insects. So you can make life so much more attractive if you are tolerant and start working on some urban biodiversity concepts, swift included, of course. Absolutely. Well, you're going to show us your, your presentation. Yep. For those Zoomers who want to see it properly, if you switch from gallery view to speaker view, then you'll get the whole of the presentation on your screen as opposed to seeing it as a little vignette in the corner of, the, of, the, of your screen. So, uh, and I think Claire might write that down for you on, in, the, in the instructions. Okay, here is my little presentation. Um, I will run through it and um, at the end, you, you tell me um, uh, if you've got questions, if you thought it was interesting. This is called DIY Swifts really, and it's about creating your own Swift colonies. And on the front here, this is one in Switzerland. It's run by a friend of mine in, um, in, in, the, in the French speaking part of Switzerland. And he mass produces these neat little nest boxes and fits them all over neighbors' villas and on municipal buildings and even things like electrical switch stations. As you can see, they're a long, thin design and that really suits those deep, deep eaves they put on Swiss chalets to keep the snow off. I'll just see if I... Oh, how do I do the next slide? Oh, yeah, that's it. That's all right. Yes, yeah, okay. that's why I've got it. I've worked it out. Why Swifts? Well, as you probably guessed, I adore Swifts, but it's what Swifts can do for other people. They're beautiful, they're dramatic, they're exciting. Now, look on the right. That's a back street in Barcelona, and that's a time-lapse photo of the Swifts just barreling through. Imagine flying like that. Oh, but the thing about this is the back streets of Barcelona are pretty grim most of the year. Look at that street. It's dark. It's dank. Yeah, on the left, we've got people who've got flower boxes, but there's not much going on in that, in the, in that, in that street. You can look out of your window and all you see is a wall most of the year. So what, what happens? I mean, mm, a lot of the year, all you can hear is drunken tourists walking about at about two in the morning, dropping bottles. It's not, not, not really that pleasant, but suddenly one day in April, you open the curtains and wow, they're screaming outside and the Swifts are back from Africa and they're bombing through and they're going to be like that for three months. They're going to bring life and drama and excitement into your dingy back street for three months of the year. Look at that flying. Look at it. It's just wonderful how they do it. And what's more, it's a bird we can help. We really can help this bird because they nest in buildings. And because they nest in buildings, once upon a time they nested in ancient woodpecker holes, in ancient forests, in ancient trees, and all that's gone now. We, we, nearly every forest in the world is managed. There's very few ancient forests left, and with a few exceptions in Poland, Lapland, one or two places in Scotland, Swifts are in buildings. The bulk of the population are in ancient buildings. So we can help them because we're in buildings too. Next slide. And this is what they do. Here's Barcelona again. This is um, a very famous building by Guardi it's called La Pedreria. And as a former, I mean, I used to work on buildings most of my career, oddly enough, um, buildings management. Uh, this I've been to, I've been all over this building and it has some of the finest, finest plaster work and mosaic work I've ever seen. Now, this is really interesting because we know that Guardi, Gaudi, sorry, Gaudi, was, in, was very interested and inspired by nature. And I do wonder, seeing the swifts scorching all over the sky, are all those curvy lines inspired by the Swifts. We know he was run over by a tram and killed just a bit further up the road and we know he was killed during the Swift nesting season. Was he looking at the Swifts instead of at the road when he walked across? Because getting run over by a tram is quite a difficult thing to do. They're quite noisy. But 
there we are we do wonder so swifts are just inspirational and they do fill the skies with action and sound so it's not just the bird flying past it's the incredible action and the incredible sounds that really make everything different for us Oops, sorry um an incredible life too long distance migrant here is a map of a swift fitted with a data logger it's fitted in cambridge with a data logger on the 23rd of july by three days later it was over madrid that's pretty nippy isn't it and then it took a long slow journey down the west african coast across west africa through nigeria to the congo it spent most of the winter in Congo and then it on the 9th of December it went for a little Christmas break to Malawi and Mozambique and it stayed there till the 21st 24th of January then it went back to the Congo until the end, beginning of uh, April then it flew to the coast at Kabinda and then it did a three or four day journey over the sea to Liberia we didn't know Swift did this three or four days over the sea means no food no water there won't be many or any insects over the sea that certainly can't drink seawater so we have a three or four day flight remember what i said about fuel economy then it feeds up for um, 11 days in liberia and then another amazing flight three or four day flight again over the sahara to the atlas mountains now again precious little water precious little insect food i mean i've been in the sahara there weren't any insects, hardly any birds, quite stunning sort of place. And once it gets across the Sahara, Atlas Mountains, okay, feeds up there for a couple of days, then across to Morocco, plenty of food there because it's a big fruit and veg growing area. And then Morocco leaves on the 6th of May and on the 8th of May, two days later, it's in Cambridge. Two days to fly from Morocco to Cambridge, a stunning performance. So, an amazing migrant. Some swifts are the longest land bird migrants in the world. The ones that come from Beijing down to South Africa, they have the longest flight of any land bird. Spends years on the wing. I mean, two or three years before it matures to breed, it'll be on the wing all the time. It's a slow breeder. One or two chicks a year if the weather is kind. Maybe none if the weather's really bad. Fidelity is built in. Uh, we think this is because um, swifts have a very short breeding season. They've got uh, the chick has to stay in the nest an awful long time um, because the chick, when it comes out of the nest, can't be fluffy and hop around the garden like blackbird chicks or robin chicks do. It's got to be fully capable of long distance flight because as soon as it comes out of the nest, it's got to fly to Africa. So it must have the full adult plumage, so longer in the nest. So the sooner that the swift can find the mate, find the old nest, the sooner they can breed. They don't have to seduce a new mate. They don't have to find and kit out a new nest. They build on top of the old nest or just reuse it. They're long lived, slow breeders, but seven or eight years is good average. And they'll even get up to 19 or 20 years old. We have a few records of very old swifts. Once past the first year, they're usually good for seven or eight years or longer. We know they can fly for days without food or water. We know they can go up to 8,000 feet and they can also skim the sand. Um, a Swiss expedition in, 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 I think it was Mali, a few years ago using a special ground-based radar system found swifts coming straight through sandstorms 20 feet off the deck i mean, incredible swifts migrating on the deck of the sahara just a few feet above the ground in those dreadful red dust sandstorms incredible there they do it though still very mysterious there's an awful lot we don't know about them I mean, ringing swifts, we had, so it's been a hundred years of ringing swifts and it's produced virtually no information about migration whatsoever. Worthless. It's okay for saying, okay, the swifts have come back this year. This baby swift has come back or this swift I ringed last year has come back to the same nest, but it was useless for finding out where they went in Africa until we got these data loggers. And when we got these data loggers developed from things put on albatrosses in the South Atlantic, 
by the British Antarctic Survey and miniaturized down the things we could put on swifts. When we got those, we started finding out this stuff in this map. And of course, wholly insectivorous. Apart from airborne spiders, all they're eating up there is airborne insects. Now, swifts are in big trouble, I'm afraid. Um, here's a couple of horrible photos, but decline. From 1995, these are the latest figures. We have got, um, oh, should we 2017, sorry. We have got, just did this slide today. 41% um, decline in 10 years, 58% decline in the past 23 years, and on average, an annual decline of 5.3%. This is bad, bad news. That means that where there were a load of swifts where I used to live, Back in 1995, we've now got less than half of them left. And that's pretty much what I see out of my window. And part of it is down to um, intolerance. On the left here, you can see anti-pigeon spikes fitted to a building. And the, unfortunately, it wasn't pigeons. It was swifts nesting in that hole. And when the swift came out, it got spiked on the spikes because they're incredibly persistent at trying to get in and out of blocked up nests. So, bash themselves against buildings to get into their old nest home hole. And it got speared and killed. And then on the right here, we have a swift that found its old nest hole blocked, probably by wrapping a building. And it's bashed itself again and again against the wrapping until it's fallen stunned to the ground. And in this case, drowned in a puddle. So normally they get eaten up by dogs and cats or foxes, but it's pretty bad. It is pretty bad. Main problems are loss of nest places and intolerance. And as older buildings are re-roofed, repaired or demolished, they lose their old nest holes. An example, uh, example here from a street near where I live in West Hampstead, owned by the local housing association. And I got involved in this because the residents complained when these buildings were re-roofed that the swifts were being blocked out. And we got the building, well, actually Natural England stopped the work until the swifts had all fledged, had all flown off. And then the work started again, perfectly legally. New roofs were put on, and instead of having holes along the eaves for the swifts, for the ventilation of the old roofs, and where the swifts had nested in these eaves gaps, they sealed those up and put on these new sort of, they look like buns, you know, grey bun ventilators, which have got a little mesh inside them. Um, which, um, which uh, uh, stops insects and birds and bats getting into the roof space. So the entire street lost its, because it was all owned by the Housing Association, the entire street lost its swift colonies. And it's, it's this way, that street after street after street. Yeah, the buildings have to be re-roofed. Yeah, they've got they're lovely buildings. They're beautiful buildings. They're quite early Victorian. They're handsome. They're nicely built. They're good for maybe another 100 years if they're cared for. Roofs have got to be replaced. Sure. But why do it in this, this way, which drives out, expels or kills off the birds and the bats that are living in this sort of building? Why have we got to be so intolerant? Why can't we design around it? It's easy to design around it. We've just got to think it through and think that we really want to keep these creatures. We don't want to live in a concrete, brick, urban, tarmacadam desert that is peopled only by feral pigeons and rats and humans and nothing else, because that all too easily is the way we go. We just, we're on a sort of auto, development autopilot that excludes everything except human and pests. The pests arrive with the humans. So it's really difficult. We've also got other problems facing all insect eating birds, which is insecticides. Um, we, we know from um, surveys done by Professor David Goulson that farmers in Sussex, for example, are spraying fields up to 22 times. A single crop is sprayed up to 22 times with insecticides, molluscicides, herbicides, fungicides and fertilizer. And that little lot will kill off absolutely everything. It will kill off all life forms except the crop. Um, quite extraordinary what we are now doing. Now, Professor Goulson considered that farmers were being gratuitously oversold these treatments. They contract out insecticide treatments, being gratuitously oversold them by an industry that's keen to just pour the chemicals on the land in as big a quantity as possible, you know, drink more milk, eat more meat, spray more insecticides. Um, and that may well be the case, but it's not helping insect populations, which are declining very fast, as we can all perceive from the simple windscreen test. And extreme weather events um, 
We've had several reports this year of extreme weather over Greece and the Balkans, killing huge numbers of migrating hirundines and swifts. Um, we've had a few years ago, we had identical uh, problems in Spain. The weather suddenly changes, becomes very cold, very wet, very fast. Uh, the insects vanish out of the air and insect eating flying birds, you know, birds that are continual flight, not hopping, um, start having a very bad time indeed. A few years before that, it was Switzerland where um, huge numbers of hirundines got trapped over the Swiss lakes in terribly bad weather and the lakes were just covered in dead swifts. Um, these events seem to be becoming more common. Extreme weather events seem to be more usual. And as well as doing a huge amount of damage to um, uh, buildings and some damage to humans, they are also very damaging to wildlife. And these are things that swifts and in fact, all wildlife are up against. But there are answers to some of this, at least. There are answers, which is nest boxes. This is my friend Bernard Jontor's house near Lake Geneva. He's got about 35 swift nest boxes. They're nearly all in use. And they are a special shape to, um, fit onto a Swiss design building. Now you might like to look at this little magnetic door here and you might think what is that for? Well that is a door which keeps sparrows out. Sparrows get nesting very early and they will pile into swift boxes. Certainly where sparrows are present they will pile into swift boxes because they love them. They love swift nest boxes. They're ideal sparrows. They don't like sparrow terrace as much, but they really love swift nest boxes. And they'll pile into them and use them and keep the swifts out. So Bernard invented this magnetic catch door, which swifts can open and sparrows can't. And it's good Swiss technology. This, If I made this, it wouldn't work. But Bernard makes this and it works like a little dream. Now, this is where it all began. I mentioned Erich Kaiser earlier. And this is his house near Frankfurt. Um, just after the Second World War, Erich went off to Oxford to study how to make honey at Gales Honey. He wanted to set up an apiculturist business in Germany and he came to Gales and he found David Lack at the Oxford Museum with his huge swift colony. And when he got back to Germany, he turned his mother-in-law's house into a swift colony, a whole floor dedicated to swifts. And there they are, you can see the holes that have been drilled with a diamond core drill through the outside of the house and inside you have got loads of nest boxes and you can watch them on TV in Eric's study. So 90 Swifts are in there and that just shows it can be done. You can get them in your house breeding en masse and these boxes do work. This is another German Swift colony. He's converted a loft window into a multiple nest box and you can see the Swifts inside. Most of the nest boxes are occupied and in use with more nest boxes on the house. Um, you can just do it with commercial swift nest boxes. You don't need to make your own. It's nice to make your own, but you can do it there. These are some swift nest boxes that Jan Stannard, who runs a major swift group and advice service, she, she slapped them up on her house when the local hotel was demolished full of, it was demolished because it, it had loads of swifts in and she set up these boxes and played calls and attracted the swifts over to live in her boxes. And that's me some years ago putting up a box on my house. This is Mark Glanville's very, very sophisticated DIY boxes. You remember Mark, Mark um, uh, showed his swift nest boxes on BBC's Spring Watch program. Um, he, they supplied cameras to look inside the boxes. Well, these are the boxes and the design for them is on our website. So if you want to make boxes just like Mark, very nice boxes, not difficult to make, but very sophisticated design, then you can download the design off our website and make boxes just like the ones on Springwatch. I, in a fit of economy, got an old claret crate from Oddbins and some scrap plywood I found in a skip. And I made this double nest box, uh, which is perfectly okay. You can put some roofing felt on the top and screw it on the wall, or you can put it under eaves, just, just varnish the outside. And you've got you know, a, nice, a nice box. It says Chateau Pujol, Mouli Medoc. And you can just have that on your house instead. I made the nest forms out of uh, paper from the office shredder and a load of polyfiller. And that was fun too. It's very nice for children to do that sort of thing. Just splunge around with this wet goo and have some fun. But 
I made that just with, you know, a, 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 um, a saw and a screwdriver and, um, and a drill. And everything, all the ingredients, well, not the poly fell up, everything else was free. Now, if you really get hooked on this, you can do things like the Frankfurt Swift Group. There's a fantastic Swift Group in Frankfurt, and um, they kit out buildings with Swift nest boxes. They've created over 2,000 nest places in Frankfurt, and they work on this basis. When they see a big new building going up or a building being re-guttered or re-roofed, they get in touch with the developers and the owners and say, is it okay if we put up some Swift nest boxes as well? And they use the same scaffolding, they wear the safety equipment, they've got all the gear, they get up there and they put huge runs of nest boxes under roof edges, under this is, this building was being re-gutted, old building, new gutters. Underneath is just two planks of wood and internal partitions, right size nest holes, 65 mil by 28 mil, run them along. Within two years, these were used by Swift. There's the Swift. You see, it's just one private, now, one group of private citizens, and they've integrated themselves into the development philosophy of Frankfurt. That everybody knows them now. They will put up the Swift nest boxes as you are re-roofing your building or building your new building. It's a fantastic idea. Now, out in the fens, Dick Newell invented, amongst many other innovatory designs, he invented this gable box which the only thing you've got to find out is the angle of your gable. Once you've got the angle, you can make this and you can make it out of scrap wood found in skips, scrap wood off building sites, all sorts of bits and bobs. You can just put them together and then you can paint it to match the building or paint it to match the bricks. It looks good. It'll be there forever. Same life as the gable and it houses loads of swifts. Dick tried one out on his daughter's house and it's utterly successful. You can, in fact, do a lot just by adapting eaves, gables, clapboarding. Um, a chap called Roland Giddy did this when his house was being decorated. It's just two bits of wood, goes across the beam ends, and it creates four swift nests. He just cut the wood to size, screwed it up, and the decorators finished it off when decorating his building. This is a bit more sophisticated, it involves bringing forward the clapboard with battens, and the right size holes but again I mean this is easy peasy if you've got the scaffolding up to do the work that is a minor addition for anybody to do for you just you just got to explain it to them give them the dimensions and bingo they can just put battens under the clapboard and you've got some swift nests in there If you're building a swift uh, a, a home extension, you can make it a swift extension too. And there's a lot of things called swift bricks now on the market. When I started, there was just one on the market. It was made in Germany. Now we've got like half a dozen companies in Britain making them. I've been trying to get British companies to make these, export these, get them around the world and, and, and get a bit of business for Britain. And we've got this wonderful one, again, a Dick Newell design called the S brick, which is lightweight. It can be made to match any brick size or any brick color. It's done on a laser cutting machine by a laser cutting company. That's one in, uh, uh, that's the trial model in, in, in cement and it worked. The Swifts used it. These ones are in better materials and you can just pop them in instead of bricks. So here's your new extension going up. If it's brick clad, get some swift bricks into it. I'd say at least three or four. They only cost about 30 quid each. So really it's nothing, it is nothing. And you will have them there for the life of the building. Churches make great nest box sites as well. And again, it's DIY local swift groups that are doing this. This is my mother's church, my late mother's church, St. Mary the Virgin in St. Neots. And across the road was an old factory with a load of swifts nesting in an asbestos roof. And that had to go. So I got Action for Swifts involved, and they came along and surveyed the site and talked to the vicar. They did the whole thing. The vicar loved the idea. Church wardens loved the idea. This is a fantastic church. You should visit it if you're near St. Neots. It's got one of those angel roofs inside. It's a huge church, and it's got these wooden, medieval wooden angels hanging down over you. It's just brilliant, and they have nice concerts there. Anyway, with the bell ringer's approval, because this will not interfere with ringing the bells, they got one box up there and one box up there. Call system playing swift calls to lure the swift 
15. You can't really see them. I mean, from the down below, you cannot see any, any, you know, any boxes, any intrusions, no visual intrusions in what is a grade one listed building after all. And here are one of the boxes going up and um, uh, yeah, that's one in place. The, the, the Swifts cannot get into the belfry. You do not want them to get inside. They don't want to get inside. The rest of it is wired against pigeons. So no intrusions and the Swifts are happy up there. They don't care about the bells. They get used to the bells just like we do. So it's a brilliant answer. And this has been a stunningly successful project. They've now put up a second set of nest boxes on another window and the Swifts are piling in and in the summer they scream around the church and just like little angels blasting through the sky reminding you that there is another world out there. But above all, enjoy your Swifts. This photograph was sent to me by a chap called Chris Richards, and he's got swifts in his gable, nesting up there. And he can sit out in the garden with a lovely glass of martini and a few, a few olives and of a summer's evening and just watch this wonderful entertainment that reminds you of the, the outer world, the cosmos, everything, the universe and everything, as they say in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It just, it's just, it's, it, just, it just tells you there's another world apart from the world of pollution and cars and exhaust and washing machines roaring away and, um, and, 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 and all, all, of the, all the horror of everyday life and banality of everyday life. It just brings you into the presence of life out there. And he says, ah, look at this. Isn't it wonderful? Swifts over your home. What a delight on a summer evening. Please help Swift spread the word. If you want any advice, pop along to our website www.swift-conservation.org and um, if you've got any questions, uh, I'd be delighted to um, uh, uh, try and, and help. Superb. Thank you very much. For, uh, <laughs> a very enthusiastic and uh, informative uh, talk on, on housing Swifts. Um, we are sort of, well, we've got another, say, seven or eight minutes before we kind of do our first hour. Um, so I was thinking that maybe we can do most of the questions in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, the after show party. But Sue Hetherington did ask quite early on, how, do, how much do the data loggers cost? Oh, they are quite expensive. <laughs> I think they're about, I think they're about a hundred quid each. I think the last time I asked, they're not for the use of private citizens. You have to get a special permission to use them, and um, I think you have to get a license from Natural England. And they are, they are, they are, they are mostly, mostly used by institutions like the British Antarctic Survey, the British Trust for Ornithology, and licensed ringers only, obviously. Um, I, I, I think you know your first port of call and asking about loggers is going to be the British Trust for Ornithology. Okay, and she did also mention here also that uh, she hosted a church in St Neot, so someone signed up to survey for bats in the church's projects. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Has... She also said that uh, she hosted at the church in St Mary's, uh, yeah. the Virgin St Neot's, has someone signed up to survey it for the Bats in Churches project? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, since my mum died three years ago, I've rather lost touch with St. Neots. I used to go every couple of weeks or so, but I've rather lost touch with St. Neots. And um, it's a very good question. Uh, someone should be asking them because um, it was a rather batty area. Uh, there's a there's a nice river running through St Neots and lots of green spaces and there's another very beautiful church and churchyard just round the corner. Um, so um, I, my guess is that St Neots could be a bat hotspot. It's also got Paxton Pitts Nature Reserve nearby, uh, which is another I would guess serious bat hotspot as well, with a with the Grand Union Canal running through that. So mm, yeah, I would yeah. Good question. Someone should be finding out. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We're going to close it here. Mm. I'll have to ask you the, 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 the key question of the night. Ready for this one? Yes. Yes, yes. What's your favourite bird? Oh, Swift, of course. Yeah. <laughs> what a stupid question. Yeah. 
<laughs> What's my next favourite bird? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and uh, if your favourite bird is the vulture. <laughs> if you could be anywhere in the world, notwithstanding uh, the current pandemic, um, where would you be right this very second? Oh, I think Formby Point, actually. Formby Point in Lancashire, because it's an absolutely gorgeous place, and I've spent many, many days up there. Um, my, I, I used to live in Liverpool for a while, and my wife comes from Formby, so I used to visit my in-laws an awful lot up there. And Formby Point is fantastic, because at this time of year, the Arctic waders are just starting to trickle back. And so you go into July, August, and you start seeing waders up there, and then in, in September, they start piling back, and then you get these huge, huge flocks of waders over Formby Point and nearby Southport and Morecambe Bay. And it's like smoke in the sky. And there's thousands upon thousands of Knott and Dunlin and Godwit are just pouring through. Um, you get little, to, there's, a, there's a, a little gull migration right through that area, right through suburban areas, you get a flow of little gulls. Um, ah, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous place. And what is more, I mean, the, it's, it's completely, um, it's, hardly, it's hardly known. Um, local birders know it, um, but um, there's a very good reserve in, in Southport, just down by the beach called Bankside, which I used to go to for years before the RSPB bought it and started managing it more, more uh, sympathetically for waders. But it's always good. Now, unless there's a massive drought, it is great. And, um, ah, no, these, these are wonder it's a wonderful place and it's hardly known. Uh, and it's so beautiful and you can stand out on the beach and just watch that, like smoke in the sky, probably millions of waders swirling around as the tides change. No, it's great, great place for summer. That's fantastic. So um, before we actually close, let me just quickly tell everyone who's coming up next. Um, tomorrow night, we have none other than uh, Caroline Lucas, MP. Um, she'll be talking with me on diversity and our relationship with nature during the cor coronavirus pandemic. Um, so that should be a good one. A lot of people already booked onto that. On Friday, I have Silas Olofsson. He's not a household name, but he is a birder from the Faroe Islands who's based in uh, Mongolia. And he'll be talking about the birds of Mongolia. He's a really brilliant birder, nice guy. And he takes really interesting photographs and he discovers firsts and seconds uh, in terms of records for Mongolia in this short period of time he's been there. So I'd be very keen to hear about that. On Friday, it's not on the website yet, but on Friday we've got Nick Baker, um, the presenter, uh, my good mate, and he'll be talking about insects because this week apparently is National Insect Week and he'll be talking about bugs. And it will be earlier than usual. I think it may be around about three o'clock or I'm not sure what time. We're still waiting for him to give us the time he can do this. And next week we've got a whole load of people uh, next week and the week after. Um, again, not cemented down yet, uh, for want of a better phrase, but one of them is a woman called Polly Morgan. Uh, again, not a household name to many of you, but she's an artist who uses birds in the art in that she finds dead birds. She keeps, I've, I've been to her house, she's got a freezer filled with dead birds, ranging from gannets to, uh, to um, gold crests. And she taught herself taxidermy and she uses these birds in really interesting art. So we'll be talking to her next week. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And also, um, just confirmed whilst I was talking, uh, whilst Edward was talking, Sasha Dench, the, uh, I think she's a niece of Judy Dench, but Sasha Dench, who, who's a woman that uh, flew with the swans, she used to work for the World oh, yes. Animals Trust. Um, she's gonna be here next week talking about her new project, which is about following Ospreys in migra on migration using the lights. Um, I think she's going to be sort of powering herself, but flying from Scotland to Gambia. So she'll be telling us how she's going to do that to follow the migration of the Osprey. So we've got some really interesting things coming up over the next couple of weeks. Keep an eye on our website uh, for more information. If you do book anything, remember to book it an hour before the actual broadcast starts. Otherwise, you will not be able to get in. And at that moment, or this moment even, Edward, thank you for a 
phenomenal hour. On it's a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. I just hope people found something interesting and enjoyable there. It was lovely to be invited and really nice to see you again and see you thriving out there. And, uh, and um, I look forward to seeing you when you get back to get back to Britain once we're let out. <laughs> yeah, you may be waiting a long time to see me back. But anyway. <laughs> and Zoom I'll come and see you. <laughs> Zoomers, thank you very much again for attending tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, keep safe and keep looking up for those Swifts. <laughs>